Okay, I'm going to continue by working through exercises from the chapter, the first chapter about invariant related problems from this book, Problem Solving Strategies by Arthur Engel. I keep uh, wanting to be more systematic and now I suppose I'm making a small amount of progress in the sense that um, when I've not been systematic, I have managed sometimes to think afterwards about how I could have been more systematic um, if I'd been a bit more sensible. Um, how one can actually do that, not with the benefit of hindsight, but um, at the time, that's still something I'm working on. Uh, <coughs> so the one I solved, the last one I solved in the previous video, I do now have um, one thought about how I could have come up with the invariant, which I came up with largely by guesswork, but I could have been more systematic by simply looking at what I wanted it to be at the start and what I wanted it to be at the end. <coughs> and assuming that it was um, some relatively simple polynomial and that would have allowed me to guess it in a more systematic way than just sort of observing from a few um, values that uh, that it happened to work. I, by, by, by work I mean actually not change, so be an invariant in that sense. Anyway, I will uh, try another Problem or two, the precise number of problems I'll try depends a little on how long they take me. But I'm always hoping that uh, I'm building up enough expertise to do them faster. Uh, so I think I've done up to, yes, I, oops, I was looking at the solutions page by mistake, but fortunately it's a solution to one that I've already done. So I've done up to 20 out of 60. Um, by the way, I haven't in general looked at the solutions page at all, even after doing the problems. Maybe at some point I will do that. So here comes 21. Three integers a, b, and c are written on a blackboard. Maybe I might write out the entire words. And one can assume that the blackboard is not vital to the question. Then one of the integers is erased and is replaced by the sum of the other two diminished by one. So we've had this kind of problem. Erase one and replace by other two diminished by one. So I presume that means that the number of integers can actually go up. So for example, we could we get rid of a and add in b minus 1 and c minus 1, but I don't know if that is absolutely right. Uh, oh, the sum of the other two. Ah, that's more like it. So now that's better. So we could replace a by b plus c minus 1. Uh, this operation is repeated many times uh, with the final result seventeen nineteen sixty seven nineteen eighty three could the initial numbers be A two 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 and B three three three. Okay, so I presume that we're looking for an invariant of triples um, that will distinguish between these two and this this thing. Um, I prefer that to arguing that you can find you know, reach this final result, but um, let's just see about that. So we can do a b c goes to any one of b plus c minus one b c or um, well let's write them all down. So a a plus C minus 1, C, or A, B. A plus B minus 1, 
it's sort of curious that you get rid of one number and then it's uh, you never see that number again so when you get rid of a for example here um, then the final whatever you do after that is only going to depend on b and c which is perhaps why these numbers are chosen to be equal uh, so does anything ch not change what happens to the sum here well that couldn't change as much as you want because of um, the fact that it doesn't depend on a so that's a little bit curious. Um, but let's just have a look at the sum on the second go. So we have, so it's very strange to have an invariant that depends only on two of the uh, numbers so it's almost as though this is a proof that there can't be an invariant but uh, <clears throat> that clearly must be wrong but let me just give the argument that it can't depend on a because um, this entire thing here doesn't depend on a but it can't depend on b because this doesn't depend on b and it can't depend on c because this doesn't depend on c so why isn't that a proof that there is no invariant? What, what do I find by an invariant? I mean a function, I've got a sort of functional equation, but so f of a, b, c always equals f of b plus c minus 1, b, c, and the same for this slot here. So this is being slightly systematic. Can I then prove, um, that would prove that f of a, b, c equals f of a dashed b, c for any a and a dashed. And similarly, the fact that it always has to equal this would, would imply that f of a, b dashed c equals um, f of a, b, c. And f of a, b, c dashed would be f of a, b, c. So I do, do seem to have a rigorous proof, in fact, that um, <coughs> any such function, so any such function, that's that f of a, b, c equals all of these three things is constant um, which is a bit perturbing so what can i say given that so maybe what happens is that after i've got rid of the initial a maybe after only after that we have an invariant um, so for example here at this second stage, I know that this number here has got to be the sum of the other two minus one. Um, and so at any future stage, since I've only the only operation I'm allowed to do is to get rid of something and replace the other, I've got to have that uh, two numbers um, add up to one more than the third number which does not happen here, but that's not a contradiction because those were the initial numbers. <clears throat> but could we, could we have an invariant um, just of triples with this property? So forget the initial um, property. Uh, so then the argument that, that the invariant has to be constant breaks down because this A has to depend on B and C. So the sort of thing I want would be that Let's just write a couple of things down. So f of b plus c minus 1 bc equals itself. That's what I get if I erase that and replace it by the sum minus 1. But more interestingly, it should equal f of uh, b plus c minus 1. And then I'll replace the b by the sum of those two. So b plus um 2c minus 2c and also equals f of b plus c minus 1 b 2b plus c minus 2. Does that look possible? So what can I say? Is this, what's the sum of these things? It's 
2b plus 2c minus 1. Here I get 2b plus 4c minus 3. So I had, I'm just looking at the sums in case there's anything I can say, not about the sums themselves, but maybe modulo something or other. So <coughs> over there I had 2b plus 4c minus 3, and then I'll have 4b plus 2c minus 3. So that's Um, you've got the sum being odd, but that's not terribly interesting, I think. It's just because it's got to be odd. When you apply that operation, is it anything better than odd? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, so maybe we can try another. So, so far I'm not really getting any feeling of a, an interesting invariant. If I were to take maybe not the sum But uh, what's the difference between these two? The difference between this and this is twice c minus one, and the difference between that and this is twice b minus one, twice open brackets, b minus one, close brackets. But that doesn't seem very helpful. So I'm now actually, uh, I've been trying to think in a kind of systematic way, but uh, I'm going to give up on that for a moment and just see what happens if I play around with 222. So I'll go to uh, replacing by the sum minus 1, so 3, 2, 2. Now I'll replace the last one by the sum of these minus 1, so that th goes to 3, 2, um, so let's see if I can ever manage to get three odd numbers. That might be a, a, a start. <coughs> so how might I get three odd numbers? I need to... Uh, it's rather difficult. I certainly can't... Can I change the number of odd numbers? Um, if I were to replace that Four by the no, that's already done. So, if I were to replace the two by the sum of three and four minus one, then obviously I'm going to get a another even number because three plus four minus one will be even. So, let's just have a look at this. If I've got odd, even, even. So my proposed invariant is just the parities of the three numbers. Um, so if I replace the first one by the sum of these minus 1, it doesn't change. And if I replace the second one by the sum of these minus 1, it doesn't change. And if I replace the third one by the sum of these ones minus 1, it doesn't change. So it looks awfully as though that's invariant. It's never going to change. So I think I've managed to solve this because after one go... We get one odd and two evens, and after that the parities of all three numbers are forced to stay the same. Which is sort of amusing. Uh, what about if I start with 333, three, three, then after go number one, without loss of generality I replace the first one, so I get 533. Three. And that is odd, odd, odd. And our target was odd, odd, odd. So we certainly haven't got a contradiction yet, but could we say something about mod 3 perhaps? Just so. <clears throat> so now I'm going to work mod 3. So this one is 2 naught naught, which we get on, on go number 2. What happens if I replace 
the first one by the sum of those two minus one, it remains as a two. Uh, notice that actually over here we see that the mod three can change, but let's just see what happens. If I replace the second one by the sum of these mod two, it can go to uh, two one zero. Um, so that's a possible thing for it to go to. Um, can I get rid of this zero? Yes, I can. I can add those two and subtract one. So that can go to two, one, two. So you seem to be able to get all sorts of things. Um, I can replace that two by a zero if I want to. Actually, that I got by replacing the third term by 2 plus 1 minus 1. But what if I replaced the second term by 2 plus 0 minus 1? That wouldn't have changed it. Um, and if I replaced the first term by 1 plus 0 minus 1, actually that would give us 0, 1, Naught, so that's another thing that we can get. Um, so we can, by symmetry, we can get uh, all three of the you know, two naught 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 two naught or naught naught two. We can get one naught 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 one naught or naught naught one. Uh, we can get. Um, well, actually, now I want to see what uh, these are. Mod three, so seventeen is two. 1967 is 2, and 1983 is 0. So can we get 2 to 0? Aha, uh -huh. still something, haven't got it yet. So how might I try to get 2 to 0? I think I can get it from here because 2 plus 2 makes 1, subtract 1 makes 0. And we can always get the permutations. So mod 3 does not work to um, rule out that final result. And it looks uh, as though what I need now is to create that result out of 3, 3, 3. Now, almost certainly, it's going to be easier to create 333 three, three out of that result. But is there a backwards process here? Because um, the operation seems a little bit not easy to reverse. But I think that's just, it's not easy to reverse in the first instance, because lots of different A's give you the same answer. But actually, after we've started, um, perhaps that's not such a problem. So supposing I've got b plus c minus 1, b, c, what could that have come from? Well, it could have come from something else BC, but where that something else has the property, that's, but supposing I did it, I obtained it by um, Oh, sorry, someone, come in! How's it going? All right, thanks. Uh, sorry about that, got a little interruption, but let me return to where I was. Um, okay, so if B plus C minus 1 B C comes from A B C, then um, If it's not boring, so if um, ABC didn't itself, if A wasn't already equal to B plus C minus 1, 
that tells us that, for example, b might be a plus c minus 1. And if b equals a plus c minus 1, then a equals b minus c plus 1. So b minus c plus 1. So if I just check, if I add that to this and subtract 1, I'll get b. So that's one possibility. And I suppose the other possibility is c minus b plus 1. B, C, and um, I think we will want to take whichever of those is the larger because the smaller one will be less than or equal to zero. So, so I think we can just say we replace it by. Uh, mod b minus c plus 1 bc in both cases. So I think that's what happens if we do the operation backwards. Um, and so if we start with 17, 1967, 1983 is indeed 17 plus 1967 minus 1. It's reassuring. So now can I replace this by the difference of those two plus 1? So the difference of those two plus 1 is 1951. So I make that 1951. And so in each case I will replace it by the difference of the two smaller ones, but add 1. So 1967 I replace by the difference of 17 and 1951, but I add 1. So 1951 take away 17 is 1934, so we get 1935. And then I can sort of see what's going to happen. I'd rather not be doing such a big calculation, but nevertheless. Um, 1951, so the difference between these two is going to be 1918, so I add 1 to that and I get 1919, and I notice that I'm subtracting 16 over and over again. Um, Do I mean that? So I subtracted 32. So why did I subtract 32? Because the difference between those two was 17. Oh, sorry, the difference between those two was 16. And then I replaced it by the difference between those two, which is uh, plus 1, which was this take away 17 plus 1. So it's this minus 16. So I've subtracted 32, and then here I've, again, subtracted 32. So I'm going to keep on subtracting 32 from these things until I get in the vicinity of 17, and one of them dips below 17. Um, so maybe I can just... This is a little unpleasant, but that's going to get me there, I suppose. Um, what multiple of 32 is near 1983? Um, well, I've got 1024. Let's just subtract 1024 to start with. Um, so that would give me uh, 900. And I take away 24 from this, and I'll get 59. And maybe I'll subtract another 512, which gives me 400 and, perhaps I'll put some dots, 447. I hope to goodness I'm not making a mistake. Take away 256 gives me 147, take away 56, 
189, just check that 9 plus 6. Whoops, that was not right. Can't get the eraser to work. Got it. 191. Um, and I'll take away 128, which will get me to 63. Um, and I'll take away, if I take away 32, I'm still okay, so I get to uh, 31. And meanwhile, over here, what have I done when I... So this is always... Um, 17, wait, this was 67, that was 16 less, so this is always 16 less, so here I get to 15. So now, now I've got 17, 15, 31, and now things have slightly changed because this is now the smallest. So I'm going to replace the biggest one by the difference of those two plus one, so I'll replace it by three. Now that one's the smallest, I'll replace this one by the biggest of those two plus one, so a difference of those two plus one, so that's 15 take away three is 12 plus one is 13, so I get 13 here. The difference between those two is plus one is 11, so what am I subtracting this time? I'm subtracting four each time. That's a little bit odd, because here I was subtracting 16 each time. Why would I? Or maybe I'm subtracting 2 and then 2 again or something. Or I hope I haven't made a horrible mistake. Um, so when I had a 17, 15 take away 3 was 12. Oh yes, I have made a mistake, but just a, a, a not such a bad mistake just around here. So... I want to replace 17 by 15 take away 3 plus 1. So that's 12 plus 1, which is 13. Right. Oh, no, that's OK. So I take away 2 there, and I take another 2 there, and another 2 there. That's what's going on. So this will go down until we get to 5, 3. Three, then I'll replace this one by help. Oh yes, that's okay. Five three three was the starting position. So I managed to prove that you can make this um, 17, 1967, 1983 out of three 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 without too much calculation by doing this backwards thing. Um, Otherwise, it would have been potentially rather unpleasant to guess um, how to go about it. Um, I'm sure there's something more systematic I could do there, but um, I don't want to think more about that, because I think I'd prefer to have a look at another problem. Um, so I'm going to go for 22. Whoops. There is a chip on each dot in figure 1.6. Okay, I'll just give you a quick rendition of figure 1.6. That has 3, 2, 1 n in each move you may simultaneously move any two chips by one place 
in opposite directions. The goal is to get all chips into one dot. When can this goal be reached? Okay, so my interpretation of the question is that you start with a, a chip, like a chip that you might get in a casino or something like that, that there are n dots around the circle, and at any go you can pick two chips and move either one of them clockwise and the other one anti-clockwise by one place or the other way around well that's not all the other way around is the same uh, so you can you move one of them one way around by one one of them the other way around and you're trying to get them all onto one dot <clears throat> um i would guess that the answer to this might have something to do with parity but um and it should be harder to do for in the even case but because parity doesn't make much sense in the odd case or well, the parity of the sum mod n doesn't make sense mod n if n is odd but um, let's just think a little bit i think i'm going to have to try a specific example so if i start with n equals 2, then I'm in deep trouble because all they can do is swap over and so I'll never get onto one place. So that kind of confirms the initial guess a little bit. I'm assuming that with 3, yeah, so 3 it's easy again, but in the other direction. So with 3 I can move that one clockwise and that one anti-clockwise, and in one go I've got them all in one place. And in fact, if n is odd, it's very easy to see that you can get them all into one place. Let me just expel it out. I suppose n is 101 or something like that. Then I'll just designate the top dot or one dot as the dot I uh, I want to uh, accumulate everything on. So I can just put the two neighbours onto that dot in one in one go, and then the two things that are one further away from the top, I'll just uh, move them simultaneously. Um, in two goes to get to the top and so on and i'll do i'll get everything to the to the top but if n is even and i try that then uh, i'm going to have a bit of trouble because i'll be left with just a, sol a solitary dot on the other side that won't have moved and uh, then it's hard to see what to do so it really does feel like a parity problem um and in D, let us have a look at the sum, because the sum mod n doesn't change if you move one in one direction and one in, in the same amount in the other direction. And I think this is just going to work out to be odd. So we have uh, 2m, we've seen this uh, 2m minus 1 all over 2. Ah, uh, wait a minute, that's not quite as, that's not quite as straightforward. Uh, so that equals m to m minus one. So if m, so if n equals twice an odd number, then we certainly can't do it because the sum um, more of all the uh, chip positions starts out odd and would have to end up even because at the end it would be um, of the form n times r for some r where r is the position of the uh, the final position of all the chips and if n is even then that thing is going to be even mod n uh, in fact it's even going to be zero mod n and actually that was <laughs> uh, maybe more the point i shouldn't talk about parity it's, it's, it's similar to the phenomenon that i used in an earlier question uh, yeah so when i add when i at, at, at the final position or the final situation the sum of all the positions 
is just n times some constant which is 0 mod n. Now this cannot be 0 mod n because um, it would have to be 0 mod 2m and this is an odd number. So an odd multiple of m is not a multiple of 2m uh, regardless of what m is. So I've solved that one. Um, so the invariant in question was sum of chip positions mod n. And uh, which and yep, yeah, okay, no more needs to be said, I think. That was number twenty one. Uh, no, it was number twenty two actually. So we're on to twenty three. So I thought <laughs> there I've gained some experience, which has helped me solve that question more quickly. But it was a rather specific piece of experience. It wasn't more. It wasn't so much general problem solving uh, experience. Um, although maybe that came into it a bit. Uh, so what have we got here? Start with n pairwise different integers. I won't bother with the word pairwise. Um, x1 up to xn, where n is greater than 2, and repeat the following step. T maps x1 up to xn, so defining this um, step fairly formally, it goes to x1 plus x2 over 2, x2 plus x3 over 2, so it's what you're going to expect now, up to xn plus x1 over 2. So each one is replaced by the average of itself and its neighbour. Show that, oh this is nice actually, show that t t squared dot 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 finally leads to non-integral components or to put it slightly differently show that we do not Um, have integer vectors forever and ever. So I hesitated there because I thought, well, surely you can, because if you start with um, just 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, then you'll just get 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, but of course uh, then it's um, not, they're not different integers. So I have a sort of idea that maybe something like the variance is going to get smaller and smaller as you do this. Um, or maybe not the variance, but something like the sum of the... Well, it could be the variance, but it could be something more like the difference, some of the differences between each... the squares of the differences between each thing and the neighbour. So I'm going to... So... Uh, <coughs> I'm going to guess, I think, and we'll see whether this works, because it sort of feels as though it has a good chance. I'm going to guess that the, the following might be an invariant that does the job. So x1 minus x2 squared plus x2 minus x3 squared plus, plus xn minus x1 all squared. So the, the, the hope would be that this strictly decreases if these numbers are different. But uh, we'll see whether that's the case. So <clears throat> what happens if we do one stage <coughs> of this process? <coughs> so x1 plus x2 over 2 minus x2 plus x3 over 2 is x1 minus x3 all over 2. So after one step of this process, we get x1 minus x3 over 2 
squared plus x2 minus x4 over 2 squared plus x n minus x2, I suppose it'll be, over 2 squared, which hasn't quite worked just like that, because this could in fact be, I think it could be potentially, actually could it be bigger? Maybe if you think about that, it would be nice if that's always smaller. Um, So let's just, I'm going to expand both of these in order to compare them. So I'm going to end up with 2x1 squared plus up to xn squared, if I expand all this lot, minus, uh, let's put everything with the 2, minus x1, x2, minus x2, x3, minus xn x1. Actually this expansion is not necessarily helping me all that much. Um, I'm now thinking I'm just going to, uh, what I've just done was a bit, it feels as though something like this could work if I repeat and so on, but I, I think I'm going to try another thing that will be a little bit more sensible, a little bit more um, simple. I'm just, I am going to do what I said in the first instance and just take the variance, or sort of more or less equivalently, I'm just going to look at the sum of the squares, see what happens. So what's the sum of the squares of these things? It's, um, so I'll get an x1 squared over 4, plus another x1 squared over 4, so I get a half x1 squared plus, plus xn squared, Plus, and what's the rest of the contribution? I'll get um, x1, x1, x2, which will be divided by 4 but multiplied by 2, so plus a half x1, x2 plus xn, x1. And this thing here, actually, I know for a fact is going to be smaller than. Actually, I can do that by Cauchy-Schwarz. Um, so this by Cauchy-Schwarz is less than or equal to, so that, just this part here, with the half there, is less than or equal to a half times sigma xi squared to the half times sigma xi squared to the half. Um, so in other words, the whole thing is less than or equal to x1 squared plus, plus xn squared. So that's good news. It goes down, or it doesn't go up. But when can equality occur? Equality can only occur if the vector x1 up to xn is proportional to the vector x2 xn all the way up to x1. In other words, the vector remains proportional to itself when you cycle around. But since they're positive integers, that can only happen if it's constant. So we know that this quantity is strictly decreasing, um, but it's also an integer. Uh, so in fact, it's even a positive integer, and that's a bit of a problem. Um, or rather, it's, a, it's an integer if the vectors always have um, non-zero uh, if the vectors always have non-zero, uh, what am I trying to say? It's decreasing if the vectors always have uh, are not a equal um, don't have equal coordinates. I suppose there's one thing I haven't quite ruled out, which is that you could start with a non-constant vector, apply this process, and get a constant one, but. Uh, you can't do that because if this equals this, that tells us that x1 equals x3. Um, hmm, perhaps you can get a constant. I'm now slightly confused. Let me just try the 
just to see what I'm missing. Let me look at one, three, one, three. This is um, taking n equals four. Did they all have to be different? Oh, yes, they did. Ah, oh, so I, have, I was missing something, actually, because that goes to, if I replace everything by the average of it and its neighbor, it goes to 2, 2, 2, 2, which then remains constant. So I need to argue that I can't get a constant vector. So I know that if I've got a non-constant vector, then the sum of the squares is going to go down each time I do this process. So I've got to argue that the only way of getting a constant vector is going to be and I think actually that's not going to be terribly terribly uh, complicated to prove. If I know that um, xi plus xi plus 1 over 2 equals t for all i, <coughs> then that gives me that uh, let's just subtract t from everything, so um, just for simplicity. Um, so my new xi is the old xi minus t, and so I can just do that. That just says that each thing is minus the thing it was minus its neighbors. So that n must be even, and the only way you can do it is just by alternating between two things. So you get sort of one three one three because if I subtract two from everything, I have minus one one minus one one. Um, so they can't all be distinct. Um, if you end up at some point getting a constant sequence. Um, what happens if n equals 2? Oh, n was greater than 2. Good. I was worried about n equals 2 because of uh, this argument broke down. If n equals 2, you, you can, in that case, have xi plus xi plus 1 equals 0 and everything being distinct. So I think I've now understood everything about the conditions of the problem and have completely solved the problem. But this invariant, I want to stress, didn't just come out of the blue. Um, it came because somehow this um, averaging operation should be sort of flattening the vector somewhat, and flattening reduces the variance. The sum is a constant, so the variance is sort of equivalent to looking at the sum of the squares, which is a bit simpler than looking at the variance. And so there we are. Um, I was tempted to do another one, but I think perhaps I'll just keep this video not too bloated and we'll stop it there. So that went reasonably well, I would say. Um, maybe the first question I'm not wholly happy with the uh, solution to the yes, you can make 17, 1980, whatever it was, 1987, 1990, no, 1967, 1983. But uh, there we are. Okay, thank you.